This is my Corvair Dash. It has that typical 1960s economy car look, complete with downward sloping underbite. I could alter it, but what I really want is this, a C2 Corvette Dash. Except it won't fit, and I can't afford one. So I'm going to try to build one, from scratch. The first thing I'm going to do is copy the shape of the C2 dash plate. To do this, I'll use an online image that is projected onto a piece of paper and trace it out. The projector is spaced so that I get the size I want, which is 18 inches. I could freehand this shape, but I figured the engineering department at Chevrolet knew what they were doing and came up with the absolute perfect shape, so I'm copying it. And look, we're almost done. It's too late to turn back now. Shut up! Cutting the old dash out definitely puts me in the fully committed category. I want to give a shout out to the Corvair purist who truly hate me right now that I will give this dash a proper burial. I'll fix a mock-up dash blade to the steering column. Basically, the steering column is a starting point where everything grows out from. A flange must be made and welded to the body so that the new dash has something to screw to. If you're wondering, this flange isn't straight, but has a slight curve. It was time to remove the steering column and replace it with a dummy tube. I use poster board for all of my CAD work. The poster board comes from Target. You know, that place that has all the interesting children's apparel. I made a bunch of practice pieces out of junk aluminum sheet. There are several complex tipping die bins that I thought I needed a dress rehearsal. The final metal used throughout the dash is 63 thousandths, 3003 aluminum. The tape on the aluminum is to keep the slip roller from marring the metal. 3003 is the softest aluminum and 63 thousandths thick is thin but still not fussy to weld. The flap panels are made to be removable. I made L brackets from 16th inch aluminum channel held on with Clicos. <clears throat> Clicos. One of the harder things to do on this project was executing the inner and outer clamshell design pods. To get the spacing correct between the inner and outer layer, I use 5 sixteenths worth of wood blocks. Pro tip, paint sticks come in sixteenth, eighth inch, and quarter inch thicknesses and are free at the hardware store. I keep a stock of them for shims. The blue sharpie lines help orientate the roll bins. But honestly, when working with roll bins, the start and stops are nebulous. The best practice is to start the bin and then check to see if it needs more bin at the leading edge or following edge. This old school slip roller is simple to use with few things to control. I found that I could vary the radius by levering the clamp screw while turning the crank. This is the tipping die part of the operation. The first pass is done just to set a track or break its back, as some would say. With each pass, pressure is applied against the upper die by lifting or tipping the workpiece. There might be five passes total to get to 90 degrees. I'm using a 3 8 bull nose profile for the upper die. It's this turn right here that I have to nail to get both the inner and outer pieces to line up when they are both put together. One of the consequences of bending metal on a curve is that the metal will either be stretched or compressed depending on if it's an inside curve or an outside curve. To alleviate the stress, a shrinker and or stretcher is used. Here I'm using a stretcher to bring back the shape of this section. This is the shrinker. Black is shrinker and yellow is stretcher.
so I purposely left the flange edge long because the shrinker stretcher teeth tend to mar up the metal. After it's trimmed to its proper size, the marred up marks are cut off. Happy with the inside pod, I'm moving on to the outside pod. I'm scribing the line here for the bead roller to follow. The outside pot is more challenging because A, I don't have the support of the gauge panel attached to it, and B, the metal wants to buckle instead of compress. The black one means we're shrinking it. Time to weld the two pieces together. The fit between the inner and outer pieces wasn't perfect. In fact, the first piece done was so far off I had to scrap it. On the second try, it still wasn't perfect, but close enough. The outcome will be the same, but when the two pieces don't fit together perfectly, it just means more weld fill and sanding. The idea is to make the inner and outer shell look like one piece when it's all done. I so like the idea of using a steering column as a fixed point to build the driver's side pod that I decided to make a passenger side steering column. It's an exact right hand drive replica as far as pitch, angle, and relative position. Moving on to the center section, the challenging part is how to fill it in while the piece dies off into the pods with all the three-dimensional curves. What I came up with is to make a mock-up piece which covers the main shape of the center piece and mark a center line and perpendicular lines every half inch on the piece. I'll use these lines to measure from the center the distance to the pod shell. Then I'll plot a graph on paper to plot the measurements. I hope that makes sense. I used a flexible ruler to smooth out the curves on the plot points. Skipping ahead, after the template gauge was made, it was cut out and transferred over to aluminum. Then a tipping edge was made on the piece. Because of the tall flange, it took a lot of shrinking to get it flat. I bet I made 10 passes here, a little at a time. To make this tight radius, I cranked up the tensioners in place and only rotated it a little. It still needed trimming, but it now fits pretty good. This is that handy rivet spacer I use to evenly mark and space holes. Since I get a lot of requests where to get one, I'll drop a link in the description. It's pretty useful. It's looking pretty good right now, but the center section needs a bit more excitement. So I'll add a step die in it, which will make it super exciting. I didn't send my best with this operation and kind of messed up a couple corners, but there's no turning back now. Because of the roll bend in this piece, I have to swap the die order to complete the operation because the roll won't fit through the bead roller. I use 45 thousandths TIG wire to act as a gauge for the die separation. To keep from leaving start and stop points, I roll on the pressure while moving forward. This is all standard procedure. Punch an eighth inch hole and use clickos to set pieces. The two advantages are you don't have to decide which fastener to use yet and most importantly, the pieces can be assembled and disassembled quickly while you're working on it. Mm. 
If you don't have a plastic contour gauge, mm, get one. Super handy. I'll leave a link in the description. I pondered how to attach the mounting flange to the pods. Reluctantly, I chose to weld them. It works fine, but it means that there is a lot of filing and sanding finish work to do afterwards. Doing this on inside corners is laborious compared to outside edges. I guess I could have just used body filler for this. I need about 60 thousandths clearance between the top of the 632 rivet nuts and the L bracket. These 30 thou washers came from McMaster and are placed underneath the rivet nuts. And here's why. One leg of the etching is about 60 thou. Smashing it down without the proper spacing would look stupid. The rubber used is ethylene propylene dyeing monomer, or EDPM, and is more tolerant to UV and chemicals. In other words, it won't crack and deteriorate as fast. I think we've had enough for today. In the part two video, I'll finish up the dash and maybe even have some dials and buttons on it. Thanks for watching.